Good evening, good evening. I'm going to try something tricky later. We're going to try to show you a video. So we're just going to see how that works. But I have great faith in the talented staff here. Uh, and I have a faith in technology. So uh, as a friend of mine from Texas used to say, I'm not from here, but I got here as fast as I could. <laughs> and I feel the same way about coming here to Chattanooga. Uh, it is my very first uh, visit. Uh, and I wouldn't be here if it weren't for Hacker uh, and Kitty Caldwell, who talk about Chattanooga as if it was the city on the hill. And it seems very much to be uh, the case. They've told me such wonderful things about this fine museum and this dynamic city, and I truly believe that. So I um, also want to share with you uh, that uh, we have a long association between the Smithsonian and the Hunter Museum, and I'll, I'll make some reference to that. And with Virginia Ann here at the helm, uh, we're going to do more. So uh, stay tuned in terms of lending exhibitions and um, individual works of art. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm beyond delighted myself to be here tonight. And I've been in, uh, in the gracious hands of uh, Virginia Ann and, and the staff today, uh, Curator Natalie, um, Nandini, and Adara in particular are, uh, have been so helpful to me. Also, we're in, good, uh, we're in good luck that we have my former board chair, John Kay, here with his wife, Billings, uh, and that makes the evening even more delightful for me. So let's begin with an art moment. As I said, technology is my friend. How about whoever's in the back advances at one? Let's see. Oh, it's me. The on switch is critical <laughs> for any technological endeavor. So today in history, September 15th, uh, as you probably know, was the Battle of Chattanooga, but I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, today in 1887, uh, the city of Philadelphia launched a three-day celebration for the most important of our documents. In that case, in 1887, it was the 100th anniversary of the Constitution. And so I begin my talk with one of the most popular works in our collection called Preamble by Mike Wilkins. Not an artist you know, but every museum is filled with fan favorites and that are deeply meaningful and make returning to the museum time and time again a special treat. So I invite you, as American photographer Walker Evans said, is to stare. It is the way to educate the eye and more. So look closely. I can see you're already beginning to puzzle this through. So uh, when I give a tour, I always stop here. What do you see? How many license plates? You're tempted to say 50, but let's not forget us in the District of Columbia, so it's 51. <laughs> and so here we have the most humble of materials about, again, as I said earlier, our noblest document, the preamble to the Constitution. It's really a symbol of American ingenuity. Mike Wilkins wrote to each of these Department of Motor Vehicles to get this unique lettering and um, numbering uh, in alphabetical order of states, you'll notice as well, too. And this work truly represents the meaning of the phrase, the United States, with a fun twist. So let's have some fun, and let's try it from the top. Okay. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, to provide common defense, <laughs> promote the general welfare, secure, thank you, the blessings of liberty, to ourselves, posterity, in order, and to ordain, establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Very good. Very good. Uh, and, and again, this is a work that means so much to us. And of course, you can date it even by the, um, uh, when these license plates were in circulation. Now we have many more choices. Uh, let me begin and tell you a little bit about my institution, my parent institution, the Smithsonian. We're now 176 years old, and it's a uniquely American institution. 
We are the largest museum, education, and research center in the world, and still expanding. You may have read there are two new museums in the works, the National American Latino Museum and the uh, Smithsonian American Women's History Museum. So give us about 10 years or so and, and come on back to Washington, D.C. and what we've, what we've created. Uh, I would tell you the Smithsonian does museums well. We build for posterity, we are thinking about the common good, and we're thinking about the through line that makes America so special. And just like the National Museum of American Indian, which opened some 15 years ago, and the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which opened now just five years ago, these museums are very quickly embraced um, by all and give us a sense of our common story. And so, uh, again, uh, I lead two museums, the American Art Museum, which has a branch museum, the Renwick Gallery, which is devoted to American craft. I'll talk more about that as well. Uh, our founder, it's a great story, and there are wonderful uh, blog posts and blog stories about this, was James Smithson, an Englishman born in France, who never, during his lifetime, set foot in America. Uh, we, we have his crypt, so he did come to America. Uh, yet he left his fortune, his name, and his passion for research to the United States of America for the increase and diffusion of knowledge. And that is our Smithsonian mission. It's a great story. We'd be here till breakfast if I told you all the little nuances of how that happened. But let's be thankful to James Smithson. Uh, I want to share with you a little bit about the incredible diversity of the Smithsonian. And so I've got a cool video narrated by LL Cool J. And let's see how that works. America. 1846, an audacious idea to grow and broadcast more knowledge than the world had ever seen. With an eye to the future, that dream was the Smithsonian, your Smithsonian. Expanding the portrait of a people, revealing the building blocks of life, to discover new species and save those we already know. A knowledge powerhouse with purpose and a community mindset. Inspiring a new generation to learn from the past. Speak up, be civic, serve a nation so that together we can step into the future with optimism. No dreams deferred. I love that bee, it gives you a little energy. <laughs> Uh, so this was done on the um, on the occasion of the 175th anniversary, which we sort of celebrated uh, mid-pandemic. But let me tell you a little bit um, about my institutions. We're going to get back to the PowerPoint. If we flip through this one and then the next one. Okay, my two buildings. First, I want to check how many people have been to either the Renwick Gallery or the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Oh my God, I'm talking to the converted. <laughs> but there are still more people to convert. Still more people to, um, and I'm, I hopefully can tell you a few things you don't know. So I lead the flagship Museum of American Art, the first federal collection of American art, located again in the upper um, left-hand corner, the old patent office. It was the third federal building built in Washington, D.C., located between the White House and uh, the U.S. Capitol. A uh, pretty good location most days, not on the mall, uh, but people still um, come our way. And again, it was designed to, um, uh, pre-Civil War, to display patent models. Uh, and patent models are critically important in terms of innovation, so this is really a temple of uh, invention uh, for these things. And even in the day when it was first built, we had 100,000 visitors in a year come through the building. 
people would come with friends and say, I think we can make a better mousetrap, what do you say? And we do have mousetrap models <laughs> in the collection as well. Um, and then we also uh, 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 have many artists who have their own patents, so it's a kind of a wonderful thing. It's not a purpose-built uh, museum, uh, but it has um, other great, um, uh, great bones and great spaces, and it's uh, two city blocks long. The other building, the Renwick Gallery, also, again, completed just uh, pre-Civil War, was the first purpose-built museum in the country. William Wilson Corcoran built it for his collection, soon outgrew it, um, and then thanks to Jackie Kennedy, it wasn't torn down to be a parking lot, um, and it was gifted to uh, the Smithsonian to be the first uh, Museum of American Craft. It's a block from the White House, and we just celebrated our 50th year, which uh, beautifully coincides with the um, ascent of the American craft movement. Again, you know, the five craft arts of ceramics and wood and metal um, and fiber and glass. So uh, although it was built for paintings and sculptures, I would tell you American craft still looks uh, pretty great in there. And of course, where are we? We are in the flagship museum of Chattanooga. We are in, you know, in the Art Acropolis here. I have to say I'm in awe of your three buildings, this hundred year span of architecture, this boldness of vision uh, to go from neoclassical to modernist to futurist. And uh, I don't want to scare you or anything like that, uh, uh, but I see your parking lot as your fourth edition. <laughs> I'm going to come back before it's finished. but. Um, so I have to say, I'm really in envy of this spectacular location. And it, again, I think invites people to imagine themselves uh, in a very special place to have uh, encounters with original works of art. So now I want to talk a little bit about how we are similar as uh, institutions uniquely focused on American art. I share with you our vision, uh, our mission here. Uh, but I would tell you that we are both uh, focused on storytelling, and it's an ever-expansive story that is the American experience. And our challenge, uh, as we accept it, is to be ever-sensitive to what our country needs. Uh, our secretary, Lonnie Bunch, speaks often about we have to make sure we are ever-relevant, have a greater impact, and even a greater reach to ensure that everyone comes to our institutions and sees themselves represented here. Most importantly, we are caretakers of collections and art that offers a window into another human being's experience and vision. And this happens across time and geography. Museums such as ours exert tremendous influence on what art is or is not preserved is or is not exhibited, is or is not known. And further, we also determine what counts as good and important, and we form the values that drive scholarship, the art market even, and the collecting priorities of other museums. That's what we do. And in doing this, we shape the visual culture and understanding for our communities and our nation. And at the root of what we do, and I, again, I love your mission statement too, is we um, connect community, and we do it through experiences. As education is one of our key activities as well, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, and I'm gonna need your help on something, so I hope you're up for it. Um, it is so important, this uh, role for museums. I'll tell you a quick story. When I was at the Tacoma Art Museum, I had a wonderful staff member, and she had two young sons. And every day, every time we had a family day on a Saturday, her sons were there without fail. One day I said, I'm so impressed you come each and every time. Um, and she told me she wanted her children to be among different children, not just those of their private schools or their Christian church. She wanted her children to be among community, a more diverse community than where they lived or went to school and worshiped. And the museum was that place uh, for the family. She wanted their children also to see a wider world, again, uh, through art. I thought that was such a lovely story, such a thoughtfulness um, as a parent. And again, we have a role to nurture and shape our own communities. And again, we do it through changing times, and aren't we living through changing times? We're doing it in a post-civil rights America, 
and also figuring out the aftermath of a period of great change, uh, of a pandemic that was not only uh, medical in nature, but was really about social justice as well. And yet I strongly believe, and I think you do too, that it is American art, which includes these powerful voices of artists of today and in the past. Artists help us better understand ourselves and others and the times we live in. And I hope I'm gonna make the case to you tonight with uh, the images I've selected. And those of us who are involved in the life of museums, we have to, again, we have to get this right. We have a sacred charge. We've inherited these institutions. We've inherited these collections. And we have to make sure that we pass it on to the next generation even better. We're teachers in many ways. We're educators as well. I have to just wave to this lovely woman I saw on the airplane yesterday. And she's a teacher herself. And I said, come to my talk tonight. And she's on the board. You may know her, the board of the symphony orchestra. Thanks for coming tonight. You got to make friends everywhere. Everybody, you got to invite everybody to come to the museum. I got, I got one visitor today that I brought. OK. Um, in, all, in all seriousness, um, the definition of museums are actually changing today. Uh, um, and there was a, a very important conference in Prague recently, the International Council of Museums, just as they sound, the Council of Museums, uh, put forth a new definition of museums. I'm gonna read it to you. I think a lot of it will sound familiar, but I'm gonna emphasize a few things. A museum is not for profit. That's actually different. There are a lot of for-profit museums out there. They're saying that it's not for profit. A permanent institution, 70 years young, here at the Hunter, in the service of society. You've been in the service of society since you opened your doors. That researches, collects, conserves, interprets, and exhibits tangible and intangible heritage. A lot of that is in your mission statement already, so you're right there. Also, museums are collecting institutions. There are a lot of institutions that don't collect art. And so uh, I think the differentiation is museums are sort of in the forever business, I like to say. Uh, and it's a reminder, again, that service to society is at the core for the common good. The Smithsonian is very much dedicated to the common good, and I also believe museums are so. Uh, and again, telling stories is critically important, and making safe spaces for difficult conversations, again, in my opinion, is at the important heart of uh, what we do. Uh, I want to share with you kind of a definition of modern and contemporary art because I think it's so important today. It is about expansive conversations, and artists are always challenging established conventions. Uh, there's a lovely quote by Maya Lin. You know her work. She was the designer be behind the Vietnam Memorial when she was a student at Yale. Uh, she famously said, can I do something in my lifetime that can help change the way we are? Can I help in a little tiny fraction make it better here? This is an artist pledging to make our world better. And I think that's, of course, the more time we spend with artists, I think that's hopefully what we, what we leave with. And so bringing artists into the community with artist residencies and speakers and all of these things is critically important for a vibrant community, which I see very much here in Chattanooga. And of course, artists are always challenging authority and questioning everything. So let's talk a little bit about my second topic, um, uh, first, sort of a little bit of how we're similar as museums, and now I want to talk about the experiential in American art. This is one of our most beloved paintings, coincidentally, in the Billings and John Kay Gallery, uh, and it is this fabulous Bierstadt. We'd like to believe that this place exists, but it's a construct. It is an artist who is taking this American landscape, uniquely American landscape, and giving it a little bit of awe and wonder and grandeur here too. And again, the European uh, artists were drawn to the great uh, um, churches and, and uh, fortresses and castles of Europe, and American artists came to look at what brings us together with these great landscapes. This painting was quite dramatically presented. There were curtains in front of it. You paid your 25 cents. You brought your opera binoculars, or you rolled up a piece of, of paper, and you looked inch by inch this was territory that you wouldn't necessarily see in your lifetime. So it was just sort of the beginning of opening these great um, railways. 
And of course, you see the presence of nature, a big theme in modern and contemporary art, always, historically too. But you also see the absence of people, as if there were no people there. But we, of course, know the Native Americans were there, um, and uh, but with the with a couple of deer up front as well. And so this is nature as Eden, as resources, uh, as part of America's manifest destiny. And let's look at the date, 1868. This is after our country has been ripped asunder. And now it is the artists who are helping build a common story, a common history for America. Uh, but three years, again, painted after the end of the Civil War. So again, American landscapes are part of what is the unique American experience. And I would tell you, every school group stops in front of this painting. It is still as awesome today as it was when it was painted. And it's gigantic. It's some like 17 feet um, large. So let's jump in, in what artists are doing uh, in conversation with such things. And these kinds of artworks, I'm going to tell you, present a heck of a challenge to museums. Earth art, this great movement um, of the 60s and 70s, was really an anti-art movement. Uh, pop art was uh, coming onto the fore here, uh, a moment of consumer culture being depicted by folks like Andy Warhol and Roy Lichtenstein. And then there's Robert Smithson going to the Great Salt Lake. This is actually a work of art that isn't always visible. It depends on the tides and the Great Salt Lake. And it is experiential. Just like that great landscape gives you this experience of wonder, you have to walk along this. You have to, it's a bit of a labyrinth and maze that you walk to and, and back. I had the pleasure of finally visiting it recently. Um, and when you stand there, you get this incredible vista. And again, it's not something you can collect, right? We're collecting institutions, uh, but you can caretake it. So the Utah Museum of Fine Arts uh, caretakes it. Uh, uh, and again, we have to ask ourselves today, who owns the work of art? And does it really matter so much who owns it? Because again, artists are interested in the temporal, uh, in, in these sort of pop-up experiences. So again, artists uh, such as Anna Mendieta, uh, Cuban-born, uses her own body as the subject matter in relationship to nature, in relationship to Mother Earth. Uh, her imprint of the body, is it a grave? She uses fire, all these elements. Again, temporary works that one really cannot purchase that we have recorded through videos and photography. So we are experiencing them secondhand, but there's this sort of um, energy around them where you know that if you were lucky enough to be there and really experience the, the, the thing itself, it would have a, have a great impact on you. Uh, I hate to say favorite works, but I love Andy Goldsworthy's work. If you haven't been to the Storm King Art Center in upstate New York, 500 acres uh, founded in the 1960s, again, this nice counter-cultural part. This, these are works that, again, are outside the museum door. Uh, this is a, a sculpture park, so, of course, everything is outside under the blue sky. And you know, our eye, our eye finishes this wall. We are following this wall as it goes into the water. Um, we can't help it. He invites us in to do this. And, of course, it, it, the experience is different at the different seasons. Right? To, to, to imagine it in the winter, you have to come again to see it in the spring and in the fall. And again, these kinds of works, I'd love to own something like this, but I'd have a little bit of a problem in downtown Washington, DC. Uh, this is a great work. Anybody experience the rain room? It is exactly what you imagine it is. It is a black room. You walk in, and it's raining. It's raining hard. But as you walk through it, it's not raining on you. Through technology, it follows the way you walk, and you are absolutely dry. And you're, <laughs> you see people doing these crazy dances trying to get wet. And it's this incredible cognitive dissonance as well, too. And again, highly experiential. And let me tell you, Virginia, Anne, and I, we do not want it to rain in the museum. <laughs> it is the last thing you want to hear about water. In the so again, artists continue to push us. Uh, this is also about nature. We have a common experience around rain, and this is really fabulous. Uh, it's been shown around the world. Um, I wish I could tell you they were American artists, but I just love them so much I had to tuck this into my talk. Uh, something quite different. This is Kara Walker, a really a truly remarkable artist, has this temporary warehouse space and creates this out of sugar. 
masses and masses of sugar. And again, look at the way she, this is an artist who grabs you by the lapels. I wanted to make work where the viewer wouldn't walk away. Again, Walker Evans tells us to stare, to keep staring. And again, you have to experience by walking it around it, it's this sort of sphinx-like figure. Um, uh, and of course, it talks about the sugar trade and the, uh, the impact uh, on enslaved people uh, in, in creating this resource, common resource, also temporary. If you didn't go, if you didn't have that experience, over. Um, so these things too challenge our notion, but uh, very powerful. Oh, even harder, performance art. Uh, so there's a famous piece uh, by Jean Tingley <laughs> that uh, um, a machine of sorts, which of course broke down after its uh, first performance, self-constructing, self-destroying in the uh, <laughs> Garden of MoMA. And then this piece, only recorded by photograph. You were invited to an opening at a gallery by Chris Burden and you were sitting in the audience and another man comes out, his friend, who was a sharpshooter during the Vietnam War, came out and shot the artist in the, in the shoulder. That's not what people signed up for that evening. And, um, and it's 1971 and we have a very different relationship then and now uh, uh, with our, with our uh, Second Amendment rights. Uh, and of course, it's in the middle of the Vietnam War. And so how could artists not be talking about the Vietnam War in ways that would surprise us and challenge us? Again, not things that you can easily bring into a museum setting. Uh, again, another artist, uh, very powerful, Marina Bronich. Uh, sometimes these all sound like international artists, but our definition of American art is if you've kind of lived, worked, studied. So a lot of these artists have spent time in America, so we would consider them um, American artists too. This was a show at MoMA, including video images. We have a video art collection. We have a video game collection at the American Art Museum, including folk art. And if you can make it out in the corner, are these two people standing sort of in the middle? Uh, they're naked, and you have to walk through them. Just like you're at the movie theater, you're trying not to touch anybody. So as you start to walk through, they start come walking closer to you. <laughs> How's that for a museum experience? Again, challenging uh, us in, in, I mean, that's gonna be a long conversation uh, about what that, ex what that museum exhibition was like. And then of course, uh, you have a pretty grand museum, but some days it's just not big enough. It's just not big enough for the imagination of artists. So if you're in London and if you can go to the Tate Modern, it's an old factory, Turbine Hall, and they invite one artist in to do something quite surprising. So Ai Weiwei, um, Chinese artists spent a lot of time in Berlin. I'm sure he'd like to spend time in America, but it's a little harder with his passport and um, Chinese control and such. Anyway, all these sunflower seeds that were painted by hand, little ceramic sunflower seeds. And he's commenting on the ceramic history of, in China as well. And then the Louise Bourgeois, I'm sorry, a little hard to read, but it's a gigantic spider and called Mama. There are certain uh, editions of this. You can see it uh, at the Crystal Bridges Museum. Uh, so the scale of these things challenges us. And so I would invite you to think beyond the walls of this august institution. Think about where artists need spaces. They need them on walls. They need them in old factories. They need them in parks. But it doesn't mean that the museum can't be part of the story. It's really about how you connect contemporary art to the history of, of art too. And let me tell you, it makes Chattanooga a destination when you have these kinds of things uh, shown in your community. <laughs> Any, anybody know this piece? It's at the convention center in Denver. Not an artist you know, but it's utterly delightful. It's, it asks us who's on the inside, who's on the outside. And aren't we all, like I was here at 10 o'clock, people had their noses pressed to the window if they wanted to come inside. I thought about my blue bear friend here. And again, what's a bear doing in a city anyway? Uh, and again, the scale of it. So there's a lovely playful, uh, um, playful quality of, um, of contemporary art. And uh, these artists are always gonna challenge us in the kind of experiences that they provide for us. Also again, today there are a lot of artists who are occupied with social justice themes. 
and they take realism as the um, uh, method in which they're gonna share those me methods uh, and those stories. Abstraction doesn't work as well. Hank Willis Thomas, again, a, a doctored image, asks you uh, about American consumerism and the young black male, maybe the athlete uh, used um, and maybe discarded in the pursuit of a athletic career. An artist I like a great deal, Paul Scott, he, uh, we, we are, we're used to our plates having wonderful English scenes or French scenes or country houses. Here he's got the border wall. You know, that too is part of our American landscape. And Wendy Redstar, she knows Albert Bierstadt's work. And she says, guess what? My people were there. I'm gonna put Native Americans front and the, the landscape is sort of the backdrop. So she, um, she owns again the landscape. Uh, and she does it, uh, um, uh, this is a series which includes four seasons as well. And these are uh, aesthetics of care. These are artists who are sort of caring about the community and, um, and each other as well. More artists who today are focused on the identity, uh, their own identity and the American story, whether it's through landscape or the Latina lesbian series, or Tiffany Chung, a, v a Vietnamese American artist who does maps and records where her country men and women were dispersed after the Vietnam War. And, and you remember that many of us have an immigrant story. Hers is a little newer, uh, but we also think about maps and, and, and where destiny took us. And then Kahindi Wiley, who's uh, in the great American portrait tradition, says whose portraits were not made uh, and why can't they be as elegant and noble and bold. And I love these floral backgrounds you remember he also did the portrait of uh, Barack Obama um, uh, that is, is so well known today. And then artists like Shirin Nishat, uh, Iranian American. And again, artists have these voices that we have to make space for. And, uh, and again, they capture us maybe with provocation, with beauty, with something quite unusual. She makes films as well as um, uh, photographs, and when you see her work, you'll never forget it again. It's really quite powerful. And she also films them in America. She, I don't know if you know the, uh, the capital city of Albany, New York, but she uses this kind of very futuristic environment uh, for some of her backdrops for her films. And then there's a social practice and a kind of community collaborative work. This is an artist named Sonia Clark. We just bought this. It's gigantic. It's a monumental cloth, as its uh, name implies. Uh, she uh, knows this very powerful but forgotten object at my sister museum, the National Museum of American History. It was a kitchen cloth, uh, you know, uh, you know dish, dish cloth uh, that was the symbol of surrender for the Civil War. And Sonia Clark says, why isn't this the symbol that we think of? Why is it the Confederate flag? And so she makes it as big as the Star Spangled Banner. And she says it should be. It should be the flag. It should be the symbol we know. And she invited people in the community to help her make it. So it's not always you know, the artist having to make every piece. It invites other people, like sewing circles, bringing other people in to create uh, pieces. It's on view right now, actually, in the, in the Renwick Gallery. And so again, I, I think with your recent accreditation by the American Alliance of Museums and your focus on the visitor experience, which is not just about comfort. It's not just about, is the bench in the right place? Are there amenities here? It's about really the powerful experiences you offer. And I had a terrific only two hours in the museum today, and this mixing of the collection of old and new, uh, highlighting uh, women artists, uh, highlighting pieces that uh, ask you to rethink the other pieces you seem to know. You go into the room and you say, everything looks the same except one piece is different. And so then you have to figure out which one is different, why, and how are all the other pieces speaking. Again, we're doing a lot of that at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And I'm here to give you a preview. Actually, I haven't even shown my own trustees this, so oh, sorry about that. Uh, this is the third floor of our building. These are called the Lincoln Galleries. It was where Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural ball took place. Everywhere in Washington, there's a little bit of spot of history or two. So we've just taken these glorious galleries down to the studs, so to speak, and we're uh, repositioning the walls 
and we are uh, creating a more expansive narrative, a bigger story of American art. People expect to see themselves represented in our galleries, and, and we very much want to deliver. So as we think about these new galleries, it's very much what we talked about today. I'm going to be quiet for a second so you can read these four points. You're fast readers, let's keep going. Um, so I, I talk about materials and methods. We talked about license plates, we talked about dirt, we talked about fire. These are not traditional art making materials. We talked about artists' voices, whether again it's social justice or pieces that talk about their own identities. And inviting viewers to contribute, again, whether you're helping uh, make a gigantic cloth or the experiential aspect. It's no longer just standing there and looking. You have to encounter that as well. And most importantly, art sparks questions. And we have a lot of questions to be answered about our own future. And I would say we are in this sparking questions business here in art museums. And we always have to ask ourselves, what is the authentic American experience today? And again, what does it truly mean to be an American? It means different things to us at different times. But again, museums have a common good uh, purpose. And so I'm excited to answer these questions in the future with you, with other museums as well. And in that spirit, um, we're overdue to send you an exhibition, if you'd like. If you'd like, we have a long history. Uh, but um, I arrived in 2017, and I haven't sent you anything. I'm, I'm behind. So we'll find something. Uh, because our collections are deep. I have a thousand works by George Catlin, Images of Native Americans. I have a thousand works by William H. Johnson. We have great postal, uh, post, um, post office murals from the WPA. Because we're a federal museum, we have transfers from other federal agencies. Um, I gave a tour to the secretary of the Department of Homeland Security the other day, and I said, hey, I need an introduction to the head of the CIA. Um, because the CIA has a really great art collection, and I'm wondering if I could bring it into my museum. He goes, I can help you with that. I can help you with that. Uh, it's true, they built a new building in the 70s, and they bought a lot of art in Washington um, Color School. So we're the recipients of some of these collections that float around in federal agencies. And so my job is to share the collections, to send exhibitions around that, that may be gaps in your own. We all have gaps in our collection. So what can we do um, like that? Here's the part where you can help me. Uh, not only do we share collections, but we share learning, right? The increase and diffusion of knowledge. So we run a fabulous summer teacher institute. We, we, we compensate the teachers for travel money. We put them up. We treat them like royalty. And uh, it's an intense experience. But we're a little behind. We only have eight teachers from Tennessee. You have to know a couple of teachers and recommend such a program for me. Um, and again, eight teachers since 2013 from Tennessee, we are lagging. And uh, here are two teachers actually from Nashville, uh, and we uh, help them teach uh, social studies, language arts through the collection, through art, so that they're not afraid of art as a subject matter that will help their students. Here's two examples. And again, if I do a map uh, by county, Hamilton County should be yellow, or green even. Um, in terms of uh, um, participation. Because again, as we teach teachers, they teach students. So it's a summer program. The um, portal opens up in February or March. So as you know, teachers really encourage them to come uh, to Washington, D.C. And, and participate in our programs. A lot of people always ask me, what's the future of American art? What's the future? And I said, we have to kind of invent it. And we're going to do that by being in close proximity to artists. That's how we're going to um, know the future of, of, um, of what the American experience looks like. I love this slide. I'm going to be quiet let you read this. It's a letter I got. I know Virginia Ann has a letter like this in her office, too. Um, it's so sweet. I'm 10, right? Like when you're little, you got to really begin with how old you are. I'm 10. Uh, by the way, my mom's signing the check, but it's my money. Uh, I, I went to the finance department. And I said, how much did this uh, so, sorry, a little boy, how much did this little boy give? And 
the Smithsonian were very much about not revealing identity, so we had to cut off the name of the little boy. And so they said, we can't look it up without a name. <laughs> uh, but I, I think it was under, you know, around $10 or something like that. And this is a sign of what we do best, is we're here for the next generation. And so I always ask people, come to a museum and bring a child, uh, because they will remember your uh, bringing them and the experience that you had. So I want to be mindful of the time, Virginia Ann. Are we on, or do you want another slide or two? We're good? OK. So I'm going to hop a little further, because I want to show you some things that we're doing that are a little new and maybe worth copying in some ways. So when we buy uh, works of art at museums, I'm always desperate to get the work of our art out as soon as possible. right? I, I'm a, 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 I believe in horror vacui. I have a fear of empty places, spaces. So every hallway, like here, or every stairwell is ripe for art. So. Um, this is a conversation between two works of art. I'm sorry it's not a good image because I just took it from my phone. But rather than a label for each work, there's a label for what puts these two works together. Can anybody guess who any of these artists are? Especially the flowers on the right. Georgia O'Keeffe. This is a smart crowd. And who was Georgia O'Keeffe's husband? Alfred Stieglitz, also hanging in your galleries. And this is a photograph that we recently bought. Let me see if I have a slightly better image. Not really. It's, it's sort of in the hallway, just in case. And um, we call it New on View Encounters with the Collection. So something new we brought in that speaks to something that's already in the collection. And that way, people get to know the depth of our holdings and understands how we now have a new conversation that's happening. Uh, we just did a show called Artist to Artist, uh, talking about Thomas Hart Benton as the teacher for Jackson Pollock. You actually did something similar with your labels in the gallery. It's very impressed. We, had, we have a little Jackson Pollock, and people are like, what? That's a Jackson Pollock? It was his cowboy years when he was in Wyoming. But again, people want to know the stories, the encounters, the relationships. Uh, it deepens our understanding, again, of ourselves. So this is one of the new things that we're working. And I can tell you it's very popular, and it's right when you enter the museum and near the museum store. So while you're waiting for somebody, <laughs> You can learn a little something, too. Oh, I just, uh, we also borrow exhibitions. You might notice that there's the uh, uh, specially named gallery in, in the corner, too. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, audience research. What do we know about our audiences? Not that much. You'd be surprised about who comes. So there was a very important study done during the pandemic. Uh, you can read it online. It's, it's um, um, a very approachable. Uh, but there were a lot of things that, uh, that made us sit up straight in our chairs. So again, we have to be more relevant to more people in what we do. And that people think that they're not included, their stories are not told in history museums, in art museums, and operas. That's a, that's a real wake-up call. Uh, and of course, there's also good news in terms of how people understand and experience museums. Again, this is in the middle of the pandemic, people asking about their museums. Often some shut, some reopened. Uh, and it, one of the important things that we also learned uh, that we have to double down on is people come to our museums, they come for community, they come from connection, they come from content. They're also looking to have a little comedy, a little relief, a little joy you know, fun facts, interesting things they didn't know before. Uh, and again, they believe museums should be at the center of communities. They should be places that give back. And during the pandemic, museums were places where there were food drives, there were voting sites. Uh, we put backpacks together in English and Spanish and dropped them off um, at schools where, where there's sort of low-income communities. People expect us to deliver beyond our own doors. And I don't mind doing that because I think that's for the common good. And the more people who know our museums in our best light will be as loyal as all of you are to this very fine museum. So I, I thank you for your good attention tonight, and I think Virginia Ann and I are gonna continue the conversation a little bit. Thank you.
Great. If you hadn't heard the question, it was, what do I think about uh, things that are of interest to his children, very smart children who are interested in TikTok and NFTs and that world. So I did mention that we have a collection of video games. It's unusual for most museums. Uh, we have to, so first of all, you have to go where artists take you. You have to follow the interests and areas of artists. Uh, I'm not 100% uh, sold, so to speak, by these non-fungible tokens. Uh, we are studying this whole issue of NFTs at the Smithsonian because we certainly have objects that one could make NFTs for. Uh, I think NFTs are also have wonderful features to it because you can track the history of ownership in a different way than you can actually track physical objects. The funding also goes back to the artist. You can write a contract that when it's sold the second time, some money goes to the artist or a third time or fourth. So there's some you know, again, there's a common good built into some of that. I still think it's a little early to tell. Uh, I saw, uh, you know, digital art uh, 30 years ago uh, at the University of Washington, Seattle, in this great computer lab that Bill Gates was funding, and it was about the ugliest thing I'd ever seen, uh, because a lot of these tech people didn't have much of a visual education in terms of color and graphic design and, and such, but then there are astonishing things you can do with these 3D representations and whatnot. So uh, I think we're gonna just have to wait and watch and keep asking questions. And I wait for something that really grabs me and says that that's really great. I'm gonna take a follow-up. I'm gonna pretend that I, you asked me something else, which is what do I think about those immersive museums? Yes. Yes. Immersive museums, right? So I went to my first one the other day and I'm going to another one. Uh, so uh, you might know the Van Gogh one. I went to a Frida and Diego Rivera one. I'm going to one for Notre Dame. So I'm trying to get excited about them. Uh, so I'm a, an original object kind of girl. I, really, I don't really want to see a projection and pretend that that's the real thing. Um, I kind of like the social aspect of it, you know, the bean bags and sitting around and looking. Uh, it doesn't, there's not enough storytelling. There are all these images projected. I need a bit of a bouncing ball. What do I need to follow and understand? Uh, so I find them difficult. Uh, I, I can see that it's sort of fun. I, it's, not, it's not filling enough for me, these institutions. But I'm, I'm amazed how people are excited about them. And so I'm hoping that if you go to that, you'll come to my institution, and maybe there won't be moving projections. <laughs> but you'll be equally excited by them, too. Yes? I'm sorry, but I don't remember which building it was in or whether it was one of your buildings. Um, do you know if the display of human ears is still a part of the Smithsonian? Uh, the question was, I'm going to repeat it. <laughs> uh, Different models of human ears. Uh, I'm, I'm running an art museum here. I think that might be a science museum, but I haven't seen it myself. We have incredible objects, uh, like the Hope Diamond is at the Smithsonian, and it came in a came by U.S. Mail in like the most innocuous box you can imagine. Uh, but uh, so we have unusual objects, spectacular. But I, I don't know about that. I'm sorry. But you can um, email the Smithsonian. We're very accessible. Uh, I mean, I answer. You know, letters all the time. The Smithsonian Magazine has a question, you know, like ask the Smithsonian, and then the question will get bounced to museum directors, so we have to answer and things like that. So we try very hard to be accessible. These are your museums, they're federal institutions, um, and again, we're here to serve the nation. I think we may have run out of questions. I gotta tell you, everybody on the plane to Chattanooga loves Chattanooga. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to take a nap. And people say, tell me these really interesting things. I'm like, oh, I gotta make a mental note. I gotta go here or whatever else. So um, you, you really, you live in a very special place. Again, I lived in Tacoma, Washington, which I call a bit of an orbital city to, um, to Seattle. But there's something about place in America. And, and this is a very dynamic place, has always been and will continue to be. But you got to support the art museum. Oh,